All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Stephanie. I'm a program manager um, for developer experiences. Up until about three weeks ago, I was on the Microsoft Edge team, but I'm now at a new company called Rapid API. Um, but I'm really excited uh, to be here as someone who's incredibly passionate about working on the web platform um, and what it can do. So today I'm going to be talking about progressive web apps, um, and I'm just going to highlight some of the features, not all, because there's quite a uh, lot that you can do with PWAs, um, but the features that you can take advantage of to create an experience that feels like a native application. And so if you're unfamiliar with the term uh, PWA, it stands for progressive web app. Uh, when I first um, started trying to grasp my head around what a PWA was, um, I was really struggling because um, it was because of the app part of Progressive Web App. Um, and I think Microsoft's documentation does a really good job of defining what a PWA is. Um, they're progressively enhanced websites and they function like installed native applications. Um, on supported platforms and then function like a regular website when they're in your browser. So they combine the best of web technologies uh, while allowing developers to also tap into and use native application features. And there's a number of reasons why uh, you might want to build a PWA. Uh, you might want to build one particularly if you want a cheap way to build for multiple platforms. Uh, that means you only have to maintain one code base. You have more distribution options, so your PWA can be installed from some app stores. Um, and then you can push your updates out more efficiently because you're literally updating a website. And they're just faster, so PWAs are built to be performant with caching resources, and they're also available offline. So there's a number of different, like, um, advantages to building one. And so I mentioned how your PWA um, has many more ways to be discovered than a regular website or application. First off, you can distribute your PWA through the traditional app store. Um, there's, an, there's an easy way to package your web apps um, for the app store with something called PWA Builder. This is an open source tool and being in app stores also opens up the possibility of promoting your app to new, uh, to new customers via cross promotions. Um, it also opens doors for discussing things like getting your app reinstalled on specific devices and operating systems as well. And once you're in app stores, um, your app may also begin to appear in search results um, as available software as well. And there's also a uh, ton of different indie app catalogs out there, um, only just a couple of which are shown here. So up here we have Find PWA, PWA Store, PWA List, and App Scope. And so to summarize, there's a whole bunch of discovery and, and distribution opportunities for PWAs that increase your app's visibility, just because it's a PWA. And just in case you're not familiar with PWAs, um, let me just set some context. Like everything I'm going to talk about today uh, involves something called the Web Application Manifest. And all PWAs have one, uh, and it's how you configure all the features that I'm going to talk about today. It's a JSON based file uh, that provides you with a centralized place to put metadata that's associated with your web application. And this metadata covers a range of different members um, from things like theme color uh, and icons uh, to the ability to scope a web application to a URL. And using this metadata, um, user agents provide developers with the means to create user experiences that are more comparable to that of a native application. And so that all gets set in your JSON file. It's your central source of information um, for all your different platforms. Um, it tells your PWA how it can behave on each platform after it's installed. 
So with that said, uh, the main thing I want to focus on today um, are the areas where you can leverage features for better integration uh, for your PWAs, mostly on desktop, but some of what I'm going to talk about today is also available um, on mobile browsers as well. Um, and this is a screenshot um, from the website whatwebcando.today. And this goes and shows you what your browser is actually capable of do doing. Like this is what the web platform is capable of doing. Um, so I strongly recommend taking a look at that site to get a sense of what your browser can do because it can actually do quite a bit. And so that's the, that's the URL for that site again one more time, whatwebcando.today. And so I'm going to focus on six um, feature integrations today. There are way, way more than this. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about just a few user experience uh, capabilities that are available to, again, make your PWA feel more like a native application. And so the first one I'm going to start off with is sharing. And sharing in uh, this context is when one app can hand off data to the operating system um, for use in another app. Uh, which is share from, and the other app is set up to receive shared data, share to. And so on the web, these map to the Navigator Share API for sharing from your site, um, and a share target definition in the manifest to receive shares. So sharing from is currently only available in JavaScript. Um, and like most modern APIs, the share API is asynchronous, meaning it's non-blocking and it's promise-based. Um, if we want to make a wrapper function for sharing, we need to make that function asynchronous, which is what you can see up here in this slide. And then inside that async function, um, we define our share data, which is a JavaScript object. Um, in the example I'm showing, the data being shared includes a title, um, some text, and a URL. And there are a number of ways uh, to trigger the share, but using try catch is a pretty easy way to do so um, in a way that isn't going to cause issues uh, for your users. And so here in the try block, um, we're going to await the promise returned by calling navigator share with the share data. Now, most browsers support this, which uh, equates to about 84% of global browser usage. Um, you can also test to see whether share is available and even whether your data package can be shared. Um, this is especially useful if you're sharing files because it will tell you whether the file format is supported. And file sharing isn't quite everywhere yet, but it is available in a number of browsers, um, just not on Mac in a couple browsers. Um, so that's sharing from our app. So let's talk about sharing to our app. Um, what we want to do is show up in the share picker. So this one here is from Android. Um, and we're going to do that using the share target member of the manifest. Uh, the share target definition looks pretty complex, but it's not overly dense, especially if you think of it as analogous to setting up um, just like an HTML form. So the first three properties, they map directly to the form element. We have action, method, and encoding. Um, this setup means uh, by these are set up, um, these set up the means by which the info is transmitted to your app. Um, so we're going to use get for recipient pages that have some interim step before submission. And we're going to use post um, for ones that don't require user interaction. And then we have um, the parameters. So think of these as your form field names. Um, this is where you're going to define the parameters that get pass passed on the query string or in the post. And then on the left are the ones the share operation defines, and the, one on the, the ones on the right are the parameter names that your app expects. Um, this object maps one to the other. Um, I mentioned you could share files. You can also accept them. Um, this example that I'm going to show is from Twitter, um, and it enables the Twitter PWA to 
among a couple other things, integrate into the file explorer in Windows. And this is supported by about 68% of browsers globally, um, mostly Chromium-based browsers. And then the next integration I want to touch on um, is file handling. So it's advertising your app as a file handler. Um, that means your app can appear in the open with context menu. Um, as with ShareTarget, we're going to define our file handlers in the manifest file again. So the file handlers member is an array of one or more file association objects. And in this object, you define the name of the file type. Here it's scalable. The MIME and extension associated with it, in this case, it's image uh, WAC SVG. And then the icons that the operating system can use for this file type, um, which here is an array of image resources. And finally, um, the URL action, like we had with ShareTarget, um, that's able to read and open this kind of file. Now, Thomas Steiner, who's on the Google Developer Relations team, um, put together a cool demo app called Excaladraw, um, and it makes use of the file handler feature. And so here, um, I have a finder window with an Excaladraw file in it. And then right-clicking that gives me an open with menu, um, and Excaladraw is the top hit. So clicking to open the file launches the PWA, even if it's not open, and opens my file. And now this whole experience uh, is made possible with just like 15 lines of um, 15 lines of JSON in the manifest file, and that's actually pretty amazing that you can tap into that that um, open with menu just just by uh, declaring that in your manifest. Um, it is worth noting that on the action page, um, you're going to use JavaScript to access the file details. Um, and this shows how you can test for support for the feature by seeing if launch queue exists um, on the window object and if files is a part of the launch params prototype. Um, as you can see from the screenshots, um, this feature is already working in Canary versions of Chromium browsers, um, and it will be hitting their stable channels very soon. Um, for an example, I'm going to talk about VS Code. Um, VS Code is actually available as a PWA. Uh, you can check it out by visiting vscode.dev, um, or if you want the beta version, you can go to insiders.vscode.dev. Uh, now, in order for uh, VS Code to be a useful uh, text editor, uh, it needs to access your local file system, and it accomplishes this through the File System Access API. Um, with this API, uh, which absolutely requires user permission um, for obvious reasons, um, a website can interact with individual files or even whole directories on the user's local machine. And the File System Access API is fairly similar um, to similar APIs in other languages. Um, it provides a host of utilities for working with files and directories, including um, everything you see on this slide here. So you can read a file, create a file, save changes to a file, open a directory. It enumerates files in a directory, create or access files or folders in a directory, remove directories, including recursively, and it can rename and move files and directories. Um, so as you can imagine, misusing this API um, can have some catastrophic effects. So please, please, please exercise caution and be responsible um, if you're choosing to use this, this API. Um, I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about the API, but I do want to show you a brief example um, to give you an, an idea of how it works. So imagine this code um, is running in a web page with a button which will wire up to the to, will wire up to open the file picker. Um, and then imagine we have a text area that will populate with the contents of the chosen file. Um, we'll also want to assume it's a text file. 
Um, so we can specify the kinds of files that we accept too. Um, but I want to keep this example fairly simple. So we can start by checking to see um, if the API is supported by testing for one of the methods. Uh, that's show open file picker, which is available on the window object. Once we know that's available, uh, we can create a variable for storing our file handle. Uh, I'll go into that more in a second. Um, and capturing references to the button and the text area. Um, then we can set up the event listener for a button click. Um, as this API is asynchronous, um, we need to make sure the callback is an async function. And then within that function, we call show open file picker and wait for a response, um, which will include a reference to the file called a file handle. Um, interestingly, interestingly, interestingly enough, um, you can store this file handle and the directory handles too um, for later using indexed DB, uh, which potentially allows you to skip this step in the future. Uh, using that handle, uh, that file handle, we can request the file itself and then read its contents, um, both of which are also um, async operations. And then finally, um, we can, whoops, we can take those contents and drop them into the text area. And so I want to circle back to this line that I have highlighted here. Um, I want to note that the show open file picker method can take an options object that defines things like the file types you can accept, common file system locations, um, you like to start the user in, like downloads or pictures, um, and you can use the same options object to define things like a suggested name for a file, um, the user is saving, um, and all of this is sort of beyond the scope of this talk um, today but there's a lot you can do with that. And so the file system access API is incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, and this sort of eliminates like one of the final major barriers to building software on the web. Um, this is still a fairly new API, um, but it has been available in Chromium browsers since, since about version 86, which means uh, roughly 30% of browsers have this feature already. Um, the next integration I want to talk about is protocol handling. Um, and if you're unsure uh, what a protocol is, I will briefly explain that. Um, technically, these are schemes, but here are some examples of protocols you might be familiar with um, and some you might not be. And what a protocol handler lets you do is declare your app as being able to resolve URLs with the identified protocols. Um, as with file handlers and share targets, we enumerate protocol handlers in the manifest again. And protocol handlers are very straightforward. Um, each protocol handler is an object with two members, a protocol to handle and the URL to root it to. Um, this example actually comes from the Outlook PWA. And then Chromium browsers currently support protocol handlers, so that's about 65% of global browser usage. Um, again, I want to caution you about using custom protocols, though. Um, if no app exists to handle that, then the URL isn't resolvable. And then let's move on to link handling. So link handling means redirecting browser tabs into your PWA. Um, if this is something that you want to do, you can add a handle links property to the manifest and give it a value of preferred. Um, other options also include auto, which lets the browser decide for you, um, and not preferred, which tells the browser not to direct links into the app at all. Um, and this feature is currently in progress within the Chromium project um, with folks from Edge and Chrome contributing to its development. Um, no one supports it yet, but you can expect it to land in those two browsers first. 
And then um, similarly to link handling, um, there is the concept of launch handling. Um, before we tuck into that, uh, I'm going to describe what a launch is. Um, in the context of this feature, a launch could be clicking the app icon, clicking a push notification, sharing content to the app, opening a file the app handles, um, using a protocol the app handles, clicking on a shortcut, and that, that was the final one. Um, this becomes particularly important um, if you're, for example, a media app. Uh, you probably only want a single instance of your media player running at a time. Or um, if your users often want to compare offerings, uh, you may want to direct links into new tabs. And t tabbed PWAs are actually something that's coming soon. And then we can control the launch of our app using the launch handler property. Now, the launch handler property is an object that controls the launch. Um, you can choose how to route launches um, into an existing client or a new one. Uh, you can also block navigation of existing clients, uh, which will route the navigation that would have occurred into a JavaScript API. Then on the JavaScript side of things, um, you capture the launch event and do something with it. So this conditional that I'm showing up here um, should look a little bit familiar. We saw it earlier uh, when I was talking about file handlers. Within the feature test, um, we can actually set up a consumer for the launch event. So this lets us do something with the parameters passed through during the launch. Um, right now, the URL is all that's spec'd out, but it would include the query string, um, and there's a discussion of routing post values this way as well. And then for support, launch handlers are currently in origin trial, uh, which means sites are already beginning to implement this feature in advance of it being shipped um, in stable versions of Chrome and Edge. Um, if you are interested in signing up for origin trials, you can go to the either Edge origin trial page or Chrome origin trial page, and that's something that you can sign up um, for and get access to. Um, and then the sixth integration I'm going to talk about is shortcuts. Um, like so much of what we've seen in this talk, um, shortcuts are defined in the manifest, once again. Um, and they enable you to define a set of context menu actions on your app's icon. So the example here, um, this shows uh, Twitter's shortcuts on Windows, on Windows 10. Um, and the shortcut member takes an array of shortcut items. So a shortcut item is an object that defines the look and behavior of each shortcut. Um, the name and icon are defined very similarly to how you define them for the app itself. Um, and the URL is where the shortcut should launch the user info. So for support, um, the shortcut feature is supported on about 70% of browsers globally, um, but it's also worth noting that PWA Builder maps the shortcuts over to the native equivalents um, for the App Store, Android, and Microsoft Store um, as well if you choose to package and distribute your app in that way. Um, so now I want to briefly touch on a few different things when it comes to the user experience design side of things um, when we're talking about PWAs. Um, and how you can make your PWA feel and look, not just act like, but look like a um, native application on your desktop. And some of these things do apply um, to mobile uh, browsers as well, but again, we're focused on the desktop experience for this talk. And so first, um, one of the things you want to consider is how you want to display your app um, after it gets installed, um, if you're going for an installable experience. 
Um, so you can have your PWA remain in the browser UI on desktop or mobile, um, but if you don't want that experience, um, whatever display mode you choose may have some user experience consequences um, that you should be aware of and plan for. So display mode is something that you, again, set in the web app manifest under the display member. And there are actually four display modes you can choose from. Um, the standalone display mode, this makes your PWA look and behave the most like a platform specific application. It's gonna open in a completely different window from the browser and it hides all the browser UI. Um, and so things like the, the address bar and some of the navigation uh, so you have no back buttons, no home button. Um, you'll just have the th three um, platform specific uh, close application, expand application buttons there in the corner. Now in this mode, um, your application can also have its own icon um, in the application launch launcher. So when you, if you want to have an installable experience, one of the criteria for standalone mode is you have to set your app icons um, in your, your manifest. Um, the second display mode is full screen display mode, and this is gonna take up the entirety of the display area available. And this again also hides all of the browser UI elements. So there are some navigation um, considerations to think about if you want to go full screen. And then the third one is the minimal UI display mode. Um, and this gives your PWA a similar experience to standalone um, display mode. It's going to open in its own window, um, but the application is going to retain a very minimal set um, of browser UI controls. And so one thing to be aware of is the UI that is retained can vary between different browsers. So if you're gonna choose to go with minimal UI, you just wanna check to make sure nothing that is crucial to your navigation is missing um, in some of those other browsers. And then the fourth one is the browser display mode. Um, and this literally just retains the browser experience with all the browser UI um, and your web app will not be installable. Um, this is what it is by default, but you can explicitly um, set your PWA to be, uh, to be in browser display mode um, and not have it installable in any way. So standalone mode, um, this is gonna give you the most native app-like feel um, and also allows for some more customization uh, with the next feature that I'm gonna talk about. Um, so this feature, uh, window controls overlay, um, it is related to display modes, um, but it offers even more control over the app title bar area um, of your PWA. Um, and this will continue to make your PWA feel like an actual app. Because if we look at the title bars of uh, a bunch of different native applications, um, that title bar area is actually used quite frequently. Um, there's all sorts of different things that get put in there, like um, search, search bars, some navigation, um, all sorts of different things. There's account information that you can tap into. And previously with PWAs, like this area uh, was unable to be customized uh, beyond um, basically the theme color. You can set a theme color in your manifest file and it will change the, the app title bar, but that, that was about it until this feature. Um, so with Windows Control Overlay, um, you're able to access that area and customize it with some CSS. Um, so it's, it's opening up everything except for those system UI buttons that we need for our window. Um, again, there's a manifest member for it, um, which we would declare after our display mode. Um, and this does say display override, but to be clear, this isn't actually overriding our display mode. Um, it's still gonna show up in standalone mode, but we're saying with this um, declaration, we're saying if, Windows if window controls overlay is supported, 
provide this enhanced title bar experience when we're in that mode. And then there are a few criteria uh, that need to be met uh, for window controls overlay to actually work. Um, so first off, the app cannot be opened in the browser. Uh, it has to be opened in a separate PWA window. Uh, the manifest has to include display override, window controls overlay. The PWA has to be running on a desktop operating system. And the current origin has to match the origin for which the PWA was installed. So when it comes to positioning and styling things in the title bar, um, we have a couple new um, CSS environment variables that have been introduced um, to help position things. So title bar area X, this is going to give us the distance from the left of the viewport um, to where the title bar appears. Title bar area Y is from the top, and then we just have our height and our width which is just going to define our title bar height and our width. Um, so this is how we are going to position our content in the title bar. Uh, once you have all that set, though, um, you're not done. So um, this example I have here, um, I've taken this from the web.dev documentation um, that's been written about window controls overlay. Um, I have my customized title bar. I have a search bar. But once I've turned window controls overlay on, um, on a platform that supports it, my title bar no longer becomes draggable. So I can't actually grab the window to move it or resize it, which isn't a great user experience. Um, so one of the other things that we need to add um, is the app region CSS property. And I, need to, I wanna specify that I want the whole title bar to be draggable except for the search bar input. Um, so this is both a user interface and a user experience consideration, because again, if my users can't grab my PWA to move it around, um, that's gonna be a poor experience for them and probably lead to a little bit of confusion. Um, but again, this is a great feature that uh, further makes your PWA look even more like a native application. Um, and this feature is supported in Chromium on Edge, Chrome, and Opera, um, but it is still experimental. Um, and so with that, uh, the behavior and implementation details um, are subject to change and probably will. And I believe Apple is also looking at this feature, um, but no details on timing or when that they may support this. Um, so I've covered quite a bit today um, and not even really scratched the surface of everything uh, you can do with PWAs. Um, if you're just getting started with PWAs or you want to learn more, these are some great resources, um, as well as the whatwebcando.today site. Um, there's also a whatpwacando.today website, and that's listed there. Um, and then Microsoft... Um, I was involved in this project. We have the 30 days of PWA. That's a great starter resource and goes through how to build a PWA and all the different um, considerations there are uh, when you're doing that and goes into the offline experience and those essential features that make a PWA a PWA. Um, and then the Microsoft PWA docs are pretty good um, as well as the Google getting started with PWA um, apps documentation. Um, so PWAs, they are incredible and relatively cheap to maintain. Um, we saw that uh, slide that had all the different features that just the web browser um, is capable of. Um, and so there's just so much you can do and not have to maintain multiple code bases. And these things will work um, on a Windows desktop system as well as an Apple um, laptop and even on your phone. Some of the features do vary um, between different platforms, but the, like, that's the great thing about a PWA and your manifest file. Depending on what features are supported, there's no real extra work that you have to do. 
Um, if someone installs your PWA on their mobile phone, um, whether they're on an Android or an iPhone, if iPhone doesn't um, support some of those features, it's not going to degrade the experience. Um, it's just going to handle it. It's just one less, um, it's progressively enhanced. Um, it's, so it doesn't really cause any issues. Um, and again, there's just so many features to leverage for PWAs, and so I hope today's talk has given you just a hint um, of what's possible because there's just, again, so much you can do uh, with this technology. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to message me or um, go ahead and follow Aaron Gustafson also on Twitter, um, whose expertise I tapped into for this talk. He is incredibly knowledgeable um, has, and has actually worked on many of the specifications and standards for PWAs, so he's a great resource. Um, and again, you can also message me. Um, and thank you so much.